so I thought what we'd do is maybe try to cover the waterfront of issues that are raised, because there's so many, I think, in the very rich and interesting book, and uh, even richer sort of subject projecting forward, looking ahead to the future books that you will write um, on, on, on this um, topic. And, but we might start with, with the sort of guts of the book, which is really this Corbyn um, revolution. I'd like to bring uh, my colleague Amanda in in a moment. But I, I guess the thing that uh, struck me the most was this role of sort of social media, you know, that this was uh, probably impossible without two things, maybe without social media and without the financial crisis in 2000, you know, and eight, because, yeah. um, you know, what's, what's, what, I find, what I do struggle about is why Blairism and, and Brownism too um, was regarded as so sort of discredited um, by the time that, um, that, that Corbyn um, was elected, because Brown, you know, has a legitimate claim to actually being a successful prime minister in terms of the handling of the financial crisis. Blair's economic legacy um, was was fairly um, strong up until um, up until um, that point. So um, the real sort of reaction, I think, is still a bit of a, a puzzle as to why this sort of legacy was rejected. But before you comment on that, I'd just like to bring in Amanda for her sort of thoughts on, on, on that sort of part of the rise of Corbyn and any questions you might have uh, or thoughts and reflections on why we saw this really radical sort of reversal that David describes in, in the book of, of going back to uh, the, the, the more harder uh, left in the Labour Party. I think that's, I mean, that's, that's one of my central questions as well. I, as we had talked about before, I lived in, in the UK from 1997 to 2005. And so I, I moved there a couple of months after Tony Blair was elected. I was there during the uh, exciting period of Cool Britannia, and you had Oasis playing in Downing Street, and devolution, and you know, movement on tuition fees. And it was this really exciting, energized period. Uh, and I guess I left in, in 2005, and so what I found interesting in reading the book was catching up on some of the details between when I had left and, and, and really what has happened since. Uh, and I think that was essentially one of my questions as well, is how you move from a period where you have Tony Blair removing you know, some of this, the socialist elements from the, the Labor Party constitution, really trying to modernize and move the party toward a, a much more centrist direction, and then ending up now with the leader that, you know, I think is essentially a, a self-declared socialist and, and really has, has moved the party back in the opposite direction from, from where Tony Blair had, had taken it, which is a, a pretty extraordinary turnaround within about 15, 20 well, years. I think, let's talk about New Labour. So I think, I think what is extraordinary about Tony Blair, and I interviewed Tony Blair for two hours, um, is let's talk. There are three things I think really we need to re recognise about New Labour. So Blair and Brown were incredibly inexperienced and young. Neither of them have ever held ministerial office. They come in as Chancellor and as Prime Minister, and they have a huge parliamentary majority and are prepared to do anything. And for those first three or four years, they did. So let's talk first of all about foreign policy. I mean, what's fascinating to me about Blair is that. Within 18 months of being Prime Minister, he's already engaged in the Good Friday Agreement, which is a, you know, a huge piece of, a huge achievement. He's already engaged in uh, trying to sort out problems of Europe. You know, he actually is a British Prime Minister who can speak French, and French good enough for him to speak to the National Assembly. Well, no British Prime Minister has ever really got away speaking French to the French. So, you know, he, he really was, you know, a remarkable Prime Minister of his time. But then we have Kosovo, and I, as a, I was running Reuters television then. I mean, for my generation, Yugoslavia was our war. You know, um, it, was, it was the war that was inexplicable in so many ways. And when Blair and uh, Bill Clinton decided to intervene, some might argue too late, over Kosovo, and there was a bombing campaign undertaken by NATO, not the UN, because they couldn't get UN agreement because of the Russians, Blair and Clinton were you know, united in this new world order. And the speech that Blair gives in Chicago in 1999, which I'm sure is a speech you would know well, where he outlines the two great threats to world peace, who are Milosevic on the one hand and Iraq on the other, so was, and that was as early as 99, Blair gets a kind of messianic fervor that 
makes him a big player on the world stage and makes him the ultimate interventionist. And they go into Sierra Leone, and then you get the election of George Bush, and then you get Afghanistan. And what people failed to notice was when Afghanistan took place, um, the left organized the Stop the War Coalition, which got very little attention at the time, chaired by Jeremy Corbyn. And whereas most people in Britain accepted Afghanistan was a necessary military intervention after 9-11, when it then went to Iraq two years later, uh, the Stop the War Coalition was putting a million people on the streets protesting against Tony Blair. So Blair's, and, and Blair's right-hand man, Peter Manson, says in the book, Iraq destroyed the kind of compact between Tony Blair and the thinking middle-class liberal element of the Labour Party. Labour's membership dropped from 405,000 to 190 odd thousand in 2003 to 2004. And Blair himself, as I said earlier, doesn't really recognise that. So that was foreign policy. He still so, won in 2005. Won with a majority of 66 because the Conservative Party was still in shambles and because new Labour still had enough traction in it on domestic policy to, to succeed. He certainly did. But it laid in, within the party, vast numbers of people had left it laid in all of those people returned in 2015. They were waiting. They waited 10 years to rejoin. So that was the first problem. I think the second problem was economic policy was working, but the way in which Blair and the Blairites were obsessed by choice in public services, introducing the free market into education and the NHS. The Brownites never really bought into that. Brown was much more of a traditional Labourite in that sense. And that was a fissure, but the biggest fissure of all was, um, was their relationship. And there's a great story um, in, the, in the book. In 20, 2007, Blair stands down after pressure from the Blairites, uh, from the Brownites, and Brown becomes prime minister. And I think this story sums up their relationship. And this was really why New Labour ultimately failed. Um, and one of Brown's key advisors says to him, let's have an early general election. David Cameron was unknown, new leader of the Tory party, seen as being utterly lightweight, had been in something called PR. Nobody knew what that was. Um, and Gordon Brown agonizes and agonizes about whether to call an election and ultimately decides not to. If he had, he'd have won a, and the polling was showing that he'd have won a majority of between 30 and 40. And his explanation for not running was Blair had got a majority of 66 in 2005 and he couldn't be seen to run and not win a bigger majority than Tony Blair. Now that just shows why New Labour was fundamentally at war with itself. Um, the other reason is they were all exhausted. Just like great governments of the Atlas government in 1950 had been in power for 10 years, they had run out of ideas. And the crash, funnily enough, saved Gordon Brown's reputation. If the crash hadn't happened, Gordon Brown would have been gone down in history as another failed three-year prime minister. The crash has given him a degree of historical validity that he otherwise wouldn't have had. But in terms of policy, New Labour by 2007 was kind of out of time. So, I mean, that explains the, the crash of, of New Labour. But how do you get from New Labour to then the pendulum swinging all the okay. way back to a, a much more leftist approach than Blair's sort of third way? So, uh, in policy terms... Uh, that it's both on policy terms and on practical political terms. In policy terms, you then have 2010, Labour in opposition for five years under Ed Miliband. And within Labour, within those five years, you, well, the Conservative government, you have George Osborne and David Cameron, who are now embarked on reversing the whole new Labour kind of economic strategy of the previous 15 years. You have austerity being brought in, substantial cuts to public services, the emphasis on reducing public debt, um, an absolutely rigorous return to uh, economic thinking that Margaret Thatcher would have been proud of. In many ways, they went further than Margaret Thatcher. And Labour didn't challenge it. Those five years, Labour was divided by itself. And that allowed the left, who were not part of Ed Miliband's regime, though they'd supported Ed Miliband, to stand back saying, new Labour austerity light is not what Labour should be doing. And this became particularly the case over certain issues that are at the heart of the, li the liberal left in Britain. And the main one is immigration. Ed Miliband, the son of immigrants, basically was producing mugs saying, stop immigration now. Ed Miliband, essentially, Labour took a policy because the threat of UKIP in late North, northern Labour seats was rising all the time, and Labour could not stake out its position, both against UKIP and against and in favour of 
an open immigration policy, and that is a, a problem within Labour then, it's a problem within Labour now, it's where the new left sits, the anti-Corbyn left believe in free open borders, believe in free movement. It's a fundamental moral issue for people on the left. Ed Miliband was seen as something who moved away from that. So in those five years, the left was able to challenge on policy grounds Labour's leadership as being nothing more than a light Tory leadership. In practical terms, Ed Miliband decided to change the way the leader of the party was elected by opening up to all members, one member, one vote, as it became known. And as I say, produced this policy of allowing anyone to join the Labour Party for three pounds to vote for the membership, never thinking, never thinking for one moment it would have the effect that it did. Nobody thought it. And that allowed the left, through the union movement, to really mobilise, but it also allowed large numbers of people who'd left in 2003 and the new young who were disavowed after the 2008 crash from any sort of political activity, apart from anti-austerity and pro-climate uh, and anti-climate change, it allow allowed them all to come into the Labour Party and that changed the economics and politics of the Labour Party forever. Could we um, look at the 2017 election? Because that, that is you know, a really interesting um, sort of election that, that you write about in terms of sort of saving you know, Corbyn and Corbynism. I mean, most people, you mentioned the, the choice that Gordon Brown had with a snap election. Yeah. Theresa May's incentives looked far more favorable even than that. She was meant to come back with a majority of 150 and, you know, destroy uh, Corbyn's labor, um, you know, that Corbyn might be gone afterwards. It could discredit, uh, you know, his uh, movement. And of course, he came back not winning, but coming fairly close and, and doing much better um, than expected. Um, I guess my question is partly your reflections on, on that election, but also do you think that, that the way in which that has been interpreted by the Corbyn left is sort of accurate? Like, is, did he do as well as he thinks, or were people basically registering a protest vote against Theresa May because they thought he would never win, and you know they're going into the next election, whenever that is, sort of assuming there'll be a bump from 2017. But is it possible, you know, that actually the lessons of 17 are something very different? And, and Amanda, maybe you could come in afterwards as well. Well, the 2017 election. I mean, I imagine all of you are pretty tired of the primary season already, right? <laughs> um, this is Washington. People love it. <laughs> I'd say I love it. Having covered two American presidential elections, I love it too. I followed Geraldine Ferraro around. You know that. <laughs> let me tell you. Geraldine Ferraro going to Chicago in '84 when the Chicago Democratic Party split down the middle between Howard Washington and Jane Byrne, if I remember, if I remember that correctly. And and Geraldine Ferraro walking into that mess was something to see. Anyway. Um, Ancient history, I know. Um, the, um, the point about primary season is it's those people, those candidates who win the primary seasons have gone through at least a year of being put through the mill, right? I mean, they've been put through the media mill, they've been put through the opposition mill, they've been put through the mill of, you know, estimable think tanks and organisations such as yours. Theresa May had never been through any mill. Theresa May had been, in my view, a disgraceful Home Secretary. And I mean, some of us regard Theresa May's policies on things like immigration as being absolutely deplorable. She cut vast numbers of police from the streets and we're seeing the effects of that now. But she was seen, and this is the irony, as a safe pair of hands who was going to guide the Conservative Party through a Brexit process and was seen as being somebody who everybody would regard as being, you know, a perfectly capable prime minister up against this lunatic bearded leftist who, you know, had not been heard of by anybody 18 months earlier. And it turned out that Corbyn ran a great campaign on the very simple message that austerity wasn't working. And Theresa May ran a highly confused campaign with two advisors who were fired the day after the election, who came up with a policy that, uh, I won't bore you with the details of the dementia tax, but where the Conservative Party's membership is an average age of 58. The, uh, the voting, people tend to vote for it, all eight, tend to be aged over 50, and they decided to bring in a policy which would basically make them all pay for their own care as they got dementia, which, if you're the Conservative Party, is not the world's greatest policy. Uh, you know, God knows why. Um, however, um, so you have this election of aberration and the two major terrorist attacks in the middle of it. 
and people forget that Theresa May is Home Secretary up against Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn, the friend of the IRA. Jeremy Corbyn, the man who'd been a supporter of Hamas and Hezbollah. Jeremy Corbyn, the man who'd been tainted or accused of being a friend of terrorists. Suddenly you have two terrorist attacks, one in Manchester and one in London. And that was the moment when Theresa May could have used all her experience as Home Secretary with the security services to prove she was prime ministerial. And ironically, it was Jeremy Corbyn who makes a speech about it that appears to be more in command. Now, that was an extraordinary election. So, coming to the second part of your question, the current thinking within the Labour leadership about is how you triangulate. The idea that they would borrow Bill Clinton's version of triangulation, I find quite amusing, but there you go. Their view is those who voted for Labour in 2017, combined with those in northern constituencies that want the vote leave, if you can combine those two groups, Labour can win a majority which is why Labour's sitting on the fence between leave or remain, okay? The problem with the arithmetic about that is by doing so, they came fifth in Scotland. Labour came fifth in Scotland. I speak to somebody who was at Edinburgh University, as Amanda was three years. The idea that Labour no. would come fifth in Scotland and third in Wales and second in London in the European elections is absolutely seismic in terms of electoral arithmetic. They're losing the young. Corbyn's losing the polling on things like trustworthiness because he's seen as not listening to the membership. But more than that, the electoral arithmetic of taking 2017 as your baseline looks as if it's eroding. But that ignores one rogue factor that no one can answer at this stage, which is who's Corbyn going to be standing against? Because, as I said earlier, Corbyn's standing against Boris Johnson I mean, I'm not clear where my money's going at the moment. I, all, the, all the thinking, if you take one simple fact, Labour has seven seats in Scotland. On the current polling, the Scottish National Party would win all seven of those seats. The Scottish National Party would use as a price for going into coalition to put Labour into power the price of having a second vote, a second referendum for um, Scottish, uh, Scottish uh, independence. And last week, I was at dinner with a man who's featured in the book, a man called John Lansman, who ran Corbyn's campaign. And I put this question to John Lansman. We'd both been drinking, so I got the truth. And I said, don't you care? He said, if we lose Scotland in order to get socialism in, in England, we're prepared to do that. That's the politics we're now in. So Amanda, 2017 doesn't give you much messaging for that. Amanda, could you reflect on that and also just maybe uh, move to the Brexit question of today as well, because we have, uh, David mentioned, you know, Labour's sort of calculations in terms of needing to keep the pro-Brexit vote on side, that they believe that if, you know, if they're anti-Brexit, the Corbynistas believe that they will lose uh, the election. So how does that sort of play out in sort of the wider context? How significant, you know, is that and where do you see it sort of headed within the Labour Party? Yeah, I think well, to, no, I, I think that's. To, I mean, that's, that's a good question for 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 you. I, I mean, the the other thing that I was was just thinking of in in addition to that, but as you were talking and talking about the American primaries, is is this this whole selection of of choosing party leadership, right? I mean, we're watching this primary process play out in the United States, where a bunch of people in Iowa stand in the corner of a gym to signify which of the candidates they support. We're watching the conservative party leadership play out now where, you know, MPs vote and then you're going to have 120,000 paid up members. And there's, of course, been changes in the, the Labor Party in the way they've selected their, their leader from an electoral college system. Uh, to I, I love the part of your book talking about this, this three quid idea where you sign up a whole bunch of members who pay three pounds, and this gives them the, the right to vote. And, and this question of whether there's a disconnect between uh, the leader who is being chosen by a, a smaller number of party members and then the, 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 the broader party membership. And then, you know, also just to, to loop that back to <clears throat> where Tom was, I mean, one of the, the, the seeming disconnects between Corbyn and the Labour Party membership is on this question of Brexit and specifically this question of support for a second referendum, mm -hmm. that you seem to have a lot of people within the Labour Party itself 
opposed to Brexit, quite keen for a second referendum. Corbyn has, has you know, of course, as a lifelong Eurosceptic, has been fairly supportive of Brexit, uh, really on the fence about the idea of a second referendum and, and seeming to prefer a general election because he believes he can negotiate a, a better deal. Uh, and so, you know, what, what that tells us about the selection of these leaders when we end up having these, these divides between the party membership and the person who is selected to represent them. Okay, I'm trying to think how I unpack both those questions. Um, so let's talk about, so let's talk about Brexit and Corbyn's leadership around Brexit, which may sort of partially answer both sides of this. So Corbyn has never really cared about Europe, apart from it being a capitalist conspiracy. And that is a direct quote. You know, he, his view of Brexit was it was a bunch of, and the view of Seamus Mill and his right-hand man, and Seamus Mill has met, written many times about Brexit, uh, or rather about Europe, and it's always about how Europe was crushing Greece. I mean, remember, this is in the context of what was happening in 2014 and 2015 in Greece, where the EU Commission and the Troika were seen as being, as crushing a socialist government in Greece. This is the view that, that Milne took prior to becoming chief policy advisor to the leader of the opposition. So it's no surprise that people like Jeremy Corbyn, who's 70 years of age and who was a big supporter of Tony Benn when Benn fought in the 20, in the, um, against Europe in the 1975 referendum, that he's against Brexit. The problem is that Corbyn stood as a member of the Campaign for Lay Party Democracy, which I write about in the book, um, in favour of listening to the membership. He was going to be the leader who was going to do a kind of gentler politics, who was going to listen to the membership and obey the membership. And the membership of the Labour Party, in the last poll, 84% of the leadership of the membership of the Labour Party was in favour of a second referendum and remain. It's a completely clear piece of policy. I think it's very interesting that twice in the last week, the question of the leadership of the Labour Party has been raised in polling, in internal Labour Party polling. The idea that Jeremy Corbyn, there'd even be the question of whether Jeremy Corbyn should be leader of the Labour Party, um, is now being raised. And that is a seismic shift from six months ago. And if you are my friend John Lansman or John McDonnell, who's Corbyn's right-hand man and chief economic spokesman, and you've spent 40 years in the wilderness, there's a quote from John McDonnell in the book saying, you know, we blew it for 40 years. We're now back. We can't blow it again. The left project is too important. Yet Brexit, the one thing none of them really cared about, is blowing it for them. And they don't know what to do. Because the Corbyn private office and some of the trade unions around him don't believe in free movement of people. They're quite happy for Brexit. But their fundamental triangulation was let the Conservatives take the blame. Their policy for the last 18 months is to do this. And let, and, let Mark, and let the Conservatives take the blame for screwing us up, except now they're also getting blamed because Parliament hasn't acted, because Parliament is just completely divided. So Corbyn's lack of desire to come out for a second referendum and a people's vote is partially because he's afraid of alienating the Leave voters in the North, but it's also because ideologically he basically is in favour of Brexit and still thinks that Boris Johnson or whoever it may be, will get the blame from the electorate. And all the polling evidence, the electorate is, that strategy is not working. Which leads you to what might happen next. And if anybody here knows, could they possibly let me know? <laughs> and my own view, which by the way, you know, if I get this right, you can invite me back and tell me I got it right. My own view is, Boris, I mean, you've got to look at the timing of what's happening within Parliament. If there's a new Prime Minister by mid-July, Parliament then goes into recess for two and a half months. Extraordinary. Um, the party conferences happen. There will be a huge fight within the Labour Party about Remain. But then we are four weeks off the 31st of the Halloween deadline. Someone's sense of irony is terrific. I love it. Halloween. Um, and the idea that Boris Johnson, if he is Prime Minister, can go back to Europe asking for 39 billion that we already owe Europe and are legally entitled to pay Europe, he can ask for his money back, he can renegotiate, he will get an extension, the, and the European Commission, which will be run by a new president of the Commission by then, because Juncker would have gone, the idea that's going to happen with Boris Johnson as Prime Minister, I find incredible, having spent 20 years of my life negotiating against the European Commission, as I did as a commercial negotiator, and Labour will sit there going, we want a general election, which 
no leader of the Conservative Party would be stupid enough to do that quickly. So we're going to be probably, I think my money now is crashing out on the 31st and Boris Johnson running a shambolic government until they get a polling lead where he thinks he can beat Corbyn and they go for an election in 2020 and there will be no overall majority. But you know something? That's a much more detailed prediction than I'm, wi I'm very unwise to make it because nobody could have predicted what's happened in the last 18 months. So let's, you know, take a leap That's of imagination. I mean, it's, it's drama. Let's, I mean, let's you know. imagine for the sake of argument that Jeremy Corbyn becomes prime minister. Yeah. And, and that there, there is an go. election at some point. Presumably it's a coalition government of some description, but uh, and Amanda, maybe you could come in in a moment on the foreign policy side, but I'd just like to start out in the domestic policy side because you mentioned John McDonnell and others. I mean, it's not just Corbyn, they, and you mentioned socialism here. When people like AOC or, or even Sanders say socialism here, they sort of mean something like social democracy in Europe, mm -hmm. right? They mean health care, education. But when Corbyn says socialism, he actually means socialism, right? He means, you know, he means... Uh, What's your definition of that? Well, he means nationalization, right, right uh, of, of significant industry, significant tax increases sure. for the purposes of redistribution. I just mean he has a, a long track record, for better or worse, and McDonald too, of the very different way of thinking about the economy. It's not a shift toward a Scandinavian model, right? It's a, or, you know... A, a, European model as it is here. So my question, I guess, is, you know, how will that sort of play out? I mean, will, if he is in a coalition, will he be forced and be willing to moderate that? If he implements it, um, are they prepared to execute it? Um, if they face pushback, as they surely will, are they prepared to overcome it? But, you know, as, as you project out sort of three, four years in a Corbyn administration, is it likely to be, uh, you know, competent uh, and radical, or uh, will it sort of fall apart very quickly because the scale of the ambition is sort of out of sync? Maybe with if the British people vote him in because they don't like Boris, that's very different than them voting him in because they want widespread nationalisation. It's a very good question, and I think that John McDonnell, who is 68, 69 years of age wants to be a great reforming Chancellor of the Exchequer. I've interviewed John McDonnell. John McDonnell is far smarter, far more astute than Corbyn, and John McDonnell wants power. And when I talk to Labour front bench spokesmen in the various key sectors of the state that Labour believes in, they are absolutely committed to a set of policies they've already developed. And in that sense, they're no different to the way New Labour worked uh, prior to 97, or indeed Wilson worked prior to 64. And it will be a radical shift back to policies of actually the 1960s more than the 1970s. But where I think it's getting interesting is the British electorate in polling isn't showing any signs of disagreeing with that. I mean, polling data when it comes to ending austerity, polling data when it comes to investing more in the NHS, or indeed you know, extending the highest rate of income tax back to people earning over £80,000 a year. Um, this is not getting a negative response from British electorate in terms of polling. There is a view, a widespread view, that child poverty, the homeless people on the streets, which in London are seen all the time, um, that there has been a fundamental failure in economic policy over the last nine years, and John McDonnell, more than Jeremy Corbyn, looks like he may have ways of addressing it. Now, that takes him to extremes of policy. You know, nationalizing the water industry, renationalizing the water industry or the railways plays reasonably well because the railway system in Britain is a disaster uh, and worthy of a sort of 19th century. Actually, it was better in the 19th century. It worked more efficiently. Um, and the water industry companies raked off vast amounts of profits and water rates have gone up. And actually, Labour is not necessarily coming up with policies on housing that people disagree with. And when it talks about a fundamental reshaping of redistribution of wealth, people are not seeing that as something that at the moment is necessarily a bad thing. The bigger issue is competence, which you mentioned. But here's the funny thing. Theresa May has handed the Labour Party an absolute <laughs> gift when it comes to the issue of competence. Well, politi politically, politically <laughs> she has, but not in absolute terms. No. So, so, I mean, they, if knows. they're in power, 
they can say, well, Theresa May was incompetent too. I mean, I guess the question is, True. will they be, you know, New Labour, for all of their faults, uh, was depending highly competent on your point of view, sure. had sort of prepared in advance of 1997 meticulously, uh, and Brown had in particular for managing <coughs> the economy. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, if McDonald's done that, and also just McDonald's McDonald's has McDonald's, done that. Had, does he understand that if Britain leaves the EU, as seems to be sort of Labour's well, that's preference will create headwinds in the economy that will be tough for any government and all the projections are that this will hit Britain economically. So what's his plan and why, why are they willing to tolerate Brexit to win power if Brexit is going to poison the economic environment once they're in power? Well, that's okay. So let's deal with it. So first of all, so Bob Kerslake, who used to be head of the civil service, is a principal advisor, John McDonnell, about how you manage government departments. They are bringing it. Gordon Brown is now advising John McDonnell, which is remarkable. So they are trying to prepare for a 100-day budget. What John McDonnell learned when he was in polit local government politics in the 80s, and I, I was a reporter who covered him, is you hit the ground running, you have your first budget within 100 days, and that budget is radical because you then got three or four years to get over it before the next election. And they are preparing what is going to be a very substantial shift in tax in macro in macroeconomic policy, which will then try and do things they think are attractive. So I think and they will also, I suspect, bring back some of the new Labour ministers who are currently on the back benches, and they will bring back people with serious government experience under their belt. But does that get you over the Jeremy Corbyn problem of looking like a man who's more obsessed by um, by Gaza than he is by you know, economic policy in Coventry, it doesn't get you over that problem. That really comes down to Jeremy Corbyn being judged against whoever is the Conservative leader. And I, my own view is Jeremy Corbyn will not stack up well in the next general election. The biggest problem that is being voiced now but throughout the Labour Party is Jeremy Corbyn's capabilities as leader of the party in a tight general election. But McDonald's pre preparations for government are well progressed and they will definitely try and go in very hard, very fast. Um, the issue which you raise, which is what happens if there's been crashing out of Brexit and GDP drop of three to five percent? Now there is a, I think it's a 25 billion war chest that uh, is currently being built up by the current Chancellor of the Exchequer, I think that was the number, but 25 billion in terms of a GDP drop of that scale, the way that the economy will contract the way that politics will be inferred is, a, is something that neither political party is wishing to admit to at the moment. And certainly Labour's plans will be absolutely damaged if they're having to deal with what is essentially a siege economy, and it will become a siege economy. Um, um, so I think, we're in, I think we're in uncharted territory for which there has been discussion, but there is no real game plan because everyone in Parliament, and this is a bit I find remarkable, is they're all sort of saying it'll be all right on the night. And for two and a half years, it hasn't been. And we're getting very close to the 31st of October. And if Boris Johnson is elected on a no-deal Brexit platform as prime minister, I think it's quite difficult for him to wriggle off that. So... I wanted to just to pick up on the, the foreign policy side. What, yeah. what you think we in the US would have to, to look forward to from a, a prime minister Corbyn? Uh, you know, his, his relationship with, with Donald Trump is not particularly warm. Uh, <laughs> and when yeah. Trump was in London, uh, Trump said he declined a, a meeting with Corbyn. Corbyn was, was quite remarkably uh, the headline speaker at the, the protest rallies in, in London against him. Uh, Trump has indicated that he might not share intelligence with Corbyn. Corbyn, of course, is very non-interventionist, so the U.S. would, would not necessarily be likely to, to support, count on, on British support. Uh, so would be interested in, in what you think on that. And then just a, a second tangential question. The, the book is, is clearly very well-researched and, and lots of interviews, but given how much Corbyn dominates the, the last third of the book, I, I found it an interesting omission in your list of interviewees that Corbyn was not among them. So was such interested a mean, in mean. That's such a mean question. <laughs> I mean, really. I've done, I, you, I think it's the 20th public meeting, and you're the only one who's asked me that question. It's a good to, so, so I, which, I'm, we have here which I'm very happy to answer. Let me just talk about foreign policy. I mean, I was, you know, it's very interesting, you know, you, know, um, you have on the left in Britain, you have two kind of views about America. 
<laughs> now, people like me who grew up on, you know, Bonanza and the Monkeys and sort of 1960s American television. And I first came here on a scholarship in 79 and worked on newspapers here and traveled by Greyhound because I and I fell in love with America. I'm married to an American. My kids have American passports. And I still regard myself as a member of the left. But then you have the other strain of the left, the, the Viet, post-Vietnam, and this is Jeremy Corbyn's strain, the post-Vietnam War and any, and, and any form of intervention, including you know, the big row over Kosovo, the big row over Yugoslavia. I had terrible rows with friends of mine on the left because I was all in favor of intervention in Yugoslavia because I'd been there. You know. So Corbyn is absolutely of the tradition that America is an imperial force um, that acts in the worst uh, instincts of global interventionism. That is, his absolute political position has been for 35 years. It's also a political position of his right-hand man, Seamus Milne. And to answer your second question quickly, I was at uh, the same college at the same university in the same year as Seamus Milne in 1976, um, when Seamus Milne's obsession even then uh, about Israel came through. And if you happen to be a leader of the left who also happened to be Jewish, as I was and am, um, and you had a Stalinist attacking you because he regarded those as, as positions that were completely incompatible, you didn't get on, and we did not get on, and still do not get on. And so three times Jeremy Corbyn agreed to give me an interview, and three times Seamus Milne ensured that didn't happen. So that's the reason it's not in the book. There you go. Uh, maybe, maybe they'll change their Badge mind. Badge of honor. You know, I, I really, actually, I don't think Jeremy Corbyn, about the way he's leader of the party now, is as interesting as what it was like in the wilderness years, which actually was the real reason I wanted to interview him. However, John McDonald's in the book and so other members of the left. I think it is very hard to see, given Jeremy Corbyn's personal track record of kind of spasmodic reaction over the last 35 years to events. So, you know, Venezuela. I mean, none of this is a thought through sort of macro diplomatic strategy. This is about reacting to short term events. This is because if you were of the left and your main output was on, Ira was on press TV, Iranian television, and RT, Russian TV. Those were the two outlets that Corbyn was always on. Corbyn, you have to understand, Corbyn was never on mainstream media. Nobody ever interviewed him. He was entirely unknown, but was always on Iranian television. And he was always on, which was transmitted to the UK, and always on Russia Today for 15 years. And so those were his outlets. And suddenly he's leader of the Labour Party. And of course, the funny thing is that Donald Trump, if you want a narrative that justifies Jeremy Corbyn's view of America, well, at the moment, you've kind of got that narrative handed <laughs> to you on a plate. I mean, I was watching the coverage this morning of, you know, the two tankers being blown up and thinking, you know, it would be an extraordinary thing in a year from now, if this would have happened a year from now, and America wanted diplomatic allies in the United Kingdom. The choice between Boris Johnson, who's clearly physically attached to Donald Trump, or Jeremy Corbyn, you couldn't find two more diverse potential prime ministers at a moment of global conflict in which America would normally be able to count on its allies. Well, this is... And I don't think Jeremy Corbyn for one moment would, would, would reinforce an American approach, military approach in Iran, because it goes entirely against Jeremy Corbyn's history. I think this oh, is a key point, that was your and question. Amanda raised yeah. it yeah. as well, which is, you, you know, for Corbyn, Trump is a huge opportunity. Huge. Right, because... Um, if it was uh, Barack Obama as president, it would be hard for him to make the case for a fundamental break in the alliance. Sure. Right? But he has an American president that, as you say, you know, uh, fits his narrative. You know, he'd have a lot... Obviously, Trump is not popular in the UK. Obviously, Trump will make demands of Corbyn um, that he won't uh, accede to. And so I guess one thing we're sort of thinking about here a bit is you know, how big a catastrophe is that? I mean, if you, if you have Corbyn, let's just say he's elected later this year. I know you think there probably won't be an election until next year, but let's assume there's one this mm -hmm. year. And there's a full year or maybe longer of Trump-Corbyn uh, relations. You know, how bad does it get? I mean, do we see an end to five eyes? Do we see, you know, uh, uh, you know real sort of hostility there? And is And this is, I think, an important point that it would be great if you could address is, you know, is there a pushback within the British system yeah. from within the intelligence community, from the broader national security establishment? And how dangerous is that for Corbyn? Because that was a big issue for Trump. You know, he, he did have obviously huge concern about him as commander in chief 
in my opinion, very justified concern, but there was pushback. He had to bring in Mattis and others. So what does Corbyn do when he's confronted with the reality of power and this uh, countervailing pressure from, uh, you know, from the Foreign Office and, and MI6 and, and the like? Well, I, I, as you pointed out, I have, a, I have an award from the Foreign Office. I was, on the, I was a non-executive director of a subcommittee of the FCA for 10 years, and I know a substantial number of diplomats. So, firstly, not to answer, let me tell you the biggest cheer I have met from, I have heard from those diplomats in the last 10 years, and that was the day Boris Johnson resigned as Foreign Secretary. It isn't just Jeremy Corbyn about whom the foreign policy and security policy establishment has an opinion. They certainly have an opinion about Boris Johnson. I mean, it's just worth pointing out. Yeah, yeah but that's political. But I mean, uh, no, no, but, but it's not just political. It's personal. <laughs> I mean, believe me. So, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, I mean, the truth is that, as you well know, you know, the, Ameri the American political establishment, the way in which the Department of Defense, the Secretary of Defense, is appointed here, is different. Jeremy Corbyn has been a long-standing opponent to Britain's involvement in NATO. That was part of his appeal in 2015. That has now been dropped. You do not hear that any longer. I think the probability of a Labour government trying to get Britain out of NATO is, is, non, is now non-existent. He was always an opponent of Trident, except unions whose members work in those shipyards that build the necessary equipment for Trident have said to him, we want this because it pays for our members' jobs. So there are compromises of political reality coming in to some of his long-held views as a backbench MP. But he has never run anything. He has never been in power. He has never had a chance to meet the full establishment weight of the civil service and the security services who give prime ministers advice that sometimes is listened to and sometimes is not. And I suppose when it comes down to it, given that Corbyn's whole campaign in 2003, you know, the Stop the War Coalition, um, was based on anti-Americanism over Afghanistan, anti-Americanism over Iraq, and his attacks on Blair have all been based on that, the probability is that you will see Britain taking much more of a back seat in all of these activities if Jeremy Corbyn is Prime Minister. But the truth is we don't actually know. And the other thing I think it's just worth pointing out is by that, if that... By, if by that point Britain is out of Europe, and presumably it will be, we're out of Europe, we have a prime minister who is an inactive supporter of NATO, an inactive supporter of the American presidency, and it wouldn't necessarily just be Donald Trump, then I suspect what you will actually see is Britain becoming even more further relegated in the councils of state, you know, internationally. Now, does that just mean we're neutralized and Corbyn is neutralized or whether he does something else that's more radical? I don't think we know that yet. I'm sorry, I know it's a, it's a bad answer. He's made very little commentary on international policy because he's suddenly facing up to the problem you're, you're, you've are you described. I don't know if you agree Great. with that so, No, I think that's right. Uh, let's take a round right. of, of, of questions. Um, so, uh, oh, a lot of questions. <laughs> okay, I thought we might have that many. So let's take a whole bunch together. So we'll, we'll start, uh, the gentleman here, then the gentleman behind. And we'll go from there. So I know this is all obscure stuff. So just, uh, well, a lot of interest, I think. State your name and also uh, no, um, uh, no bi biographies, long biographies or stories, but just a question. Thanks. Yeah, Howard Marks. Thank you, David. Um, uh, my question is, I think you just mentioned that uh, Jeremy Corbyn was a supporter or is a supporter of Hezbollah. Hezbollah is, uh, in its 1985 manifesto, call for the destruction of Israel. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to comment on that. Thank you. Thanks. Gentleman behind. Yeah. As did Hamas, of which he was also a supporter. Sure. Yeah, thank you. I'm Mark Tokolov from the Korea Economic Institute. It's hard to predict the future, so let's go back and predict the past instead. If John Smith had lived, mm. uh, would Labour be the biggest party in Scotland, and would UK be part of the Eurozone? Great question. Um, just behind again, and then we'll take these two, we'll take five together, and I think they'll be on similar Okay, I may have to take notes because my memory is lapsing. Um, my name's Leo. Thank you for your talk. Would you mind taking a moment to explain some of the sources of opposition to Corbyn within the Labour Party, within the Left Project, not just in terms of personalities, but sort of distinct, identifiable groups? Sure. Um, we'll, we'll, let's do those three, and then we'll come back, and we'll get over here to them. Yeah. Um, Israel. Well, um, Jeremy Corbyn and, and Seamus Milne 
both have long track records of their support, their stated and open support. There's a YouTube video of them giving speeches in 2009 uh, in Hyde Park where they pledge support to both Hamas and Hezbollah in terms. And as you know, and both organizations are, as you're aware, pledged to not, not to reach any sort of diplomatic solution, but pledged to push Israel into the sea, I seem to remember is the statement there. And there's a famous episode of Corbyn holding a wreath, as you'll probably be aware, in Tunis in 2013. There's a photograph of Jeremy Corbyn being invited to a conference in Tunis by uh, a bunch of uh, Palestinian groups holding a wreath um, and the big row of a year ago, one of the many rounds about his apparent anti-Semitism was whether was that wreath intended for 45 people being killed in Israeli airstrikes or was intended for the <laughs> members of Black September who were responsible for the Munich Olympics massacre. And first of all, he denied he was holding a wreath, which was slightly unfortunate because the thing is enormous. <laughs> and secondly, he's standing next to the grave of Black September. But actually what I found more interesting about that photo was the guy standing just behind him was the president in exile of the PFLP and the PFLP a month later killed four rabbis in Jerusalem. Or was it Tel Aviv? And there was no comment from the then backbencher Jeremy Corbyn. So now, the, uh, I was at the Labour Party conference last year where the Palestinian cause is very reminiscent of some of my generation of anti-apartheid. I was president of anti-apartheid in Oxford in the 70s and 80s where you believed at the end of apartheid in South Africa. It has now taken on that potency within the left. But the real division within the left is whether you believe the state of Israel has a right to exist. And this was the row, I mean, you can read about it in the book, the big row last year within Corbyn's Labour Party was about the definitions of anti-Semitism and the IHRA definition. What is shocking now is that the Labour Party is being investigated by uh, the main statutory body in Britain for institutionalized anti-Semitism based on their view of Israel as well as on anti-Semitism. So that's my comment. My commentary is this is an iceberg that is getting closer and closer to the ship of the leadership because they, that organization has access to all internal emails, all phone calls, and it's going to be revealing some very ugly stuff. And for British Jewry, this is a huge problem. That's normally been a labor supporting segment. It's a huge problem. John Smith. Um, I can remember when, some of you won't know who I'm talking about, when Tony Crossland died, who was Labour Foreign Secretary in 1977, because I was at his last meeting, and a man closest in political ideology to me, and I absolutely remember where I was when John Smith died. And John Smith, and I mean, there's quite a lot about John Smith in the book, because John Smith didn't approve of Blair and Brown, who were challenging him from... Uh, the right and left is the wrong definition here, but we're certainly challenging his, what regard as too conservative leadership. They wanted a modernized body for us. If John Smith had lived, Blair and Brown would have had a huge falling out with him sooner or later. In fact, they were already aiming for it. But John Smith was a notable great politician who died in 1994, which led to the election of Tony Blair as Labour leader, and the rest is history. Would the effect of John Smith winning, as I'm sure he would have done, the election in 97? have saved Labour in Scotland. Well, you look at what Labour did in Scotland in, with um, uh, uh, Donald Dewar being, you know, doing, doing um, the uh, devolution bill, Donald Dewar becoming first minister. And I actually suspect, to your part of your question, if Donald Dewar had lived, you may disagree with me about this, the combination of John Smith and Donald Dewar both dying meant that Labour's dominance in Scotland suddenly got, disappeared because the leadership of Labour in Scotland became very highly variable in terms of quality, and still is. So my suspicion is John Smith would have been a great Prime Minister, and my suspicion is Donald Dewar and John Smith would have held Labour together a bit more in Scotland, but actually the truth is the SNP were already on the rise, and of course now they have a highly capable leader as First Minister in Scotland. I'm not sure the memory of John Smith, even as Prime Minister, would have negated that. Um, opposition to... Um, uh, Labour uh, to, the, to the left in the Labour Party. Well, um, there's very tired opposition to the Labour Party from the Blairites and the Brownites. The new Labour opposition has basically come to an end. It had its moment and it isn't really there. The challenge in 2016, I'm sorry, I'm trying to see who asked the question. I know I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm looking at the wrong person. The challenge in 2016, which I detail the chicken coup, you know why it was known as the chicken coup? because they were all chicken. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, and I, I mean, that's why it's known as the chicken coup. 
Um, they failed to understand what they were challenging, and it was their last hurrah. The challenge now to Jeremy Corbyn is coming from the left. It's not coming from the right. It's coming, and that challenge is going to be seen in two ways. One, what is the current membership of the Labour Party? Because the strong argument of suspicion is all those people who joined in 2015 as Corbynistas are now leaving, disappointed by what he's not done. And the other challenge is over Brexit and over the fact that he appears not to be listening to the membership. So the challenge is changing in a way that no one really would have expected even two years ago. And the fact that there are now discussions about challenging him for the leadership is interesting. The problem is who would challenge him? Because nobody from the centre and right would win. So at the moment, Jeremy Corbyn is the leader they're stuck with, certainly until after the next general election, in my view. Thanks. Amanda, any thoughts? Or no, I agree on Scott. Uh, okay, so we'll Thank take uh, these two <laughs> gentlemen here and then uh, these two ladies on the side and, and then we'll go back. You see, in Britain now, you have to have gender balancing on questions. I see you don't have that. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that one in, <coughs> which is fine. Thank you, Larry Checo. My brief story is my question. Uh, in 2004, when George Bush was re-elected by America, yep. a friend of mine's um, mother was living in London. She called up her son the very next morning and said, Jeff, yesterday the Iraqi war was George Bush's war. Today it's America's war. Should we re-elect Donald Trump? What would, would, would be English sentiment regarding you know, making the parallel between, you know, George yeah. Bush and what's going on here. I'm guessing they'll be disappointed, but I don't want to uh, prejudice uh, okay. them. <laughs> yeah, the gentleman here, and then we'll go along the side. Yeah. Uh, Peter Doyle, I want to follow up on that question about the missing right in the Labour Party now, and particularly ask what, if you have views as to why it's missing, and I'll explain my question in the following way. You could, you've described the, the Blair uh, Labour um, government as, as one of remarkable substantive success on a number of fronts. Mm -hmm. But looking back, uh, well, in fact, even looking at the time, there were really major flaws. Sure. They took a far too generous view of the truth coming out of finance. Of they believe finance, finance, the financial sector, yeah, sure. which produced the financial crisis. Sure. Uh, they also took a far too glib view of the downsides of globalization. I mean, Blair said, you know, talking about questioning globalization is like questioning whether the sun should rise in the morning. Well, as we now know, that is fundamentally wrong. There are real problems mm -hmm. which they overlooked. So there is a problem for the centre-right in Labour now, which is they have to both address the problems which Blair got wrong and distinguish themselves from Corbyn. So... That's not impossible. There is, there is a fervent view in academia debating about where, what that is, what, the, what Blair got wrong and why Corbyn's answers are not right. Mm -hmm. But they're not appearing in the centre-right of the Labour Party. The question is, why not? Okay. Great, thanks. And then two, two more, um, the, the lady here and then the lady behind. Yeah. So my question is about the electoral math of the next general election. You mentioned that Labour would potentially be in a coalition, and the question is with whom. And so my question is about the Liberal Democrats. You talked a little bit about the results of the European election, and one of the beneficiaries of the fracture has been the Liberal Democrats. They did much better in that election. And so my question is, what do you think will happen with the Liberal Democrats in the next election, and how will Labour need to deal with them as potential partners? Great question, and, and then final question, yes. Thank you. I've got it. Hi, actually Hi. my question is about gender balancing. <laughs> I'd be interesting, interested in hearing your thoughts on when uh, there, there will be a woman among the leadership okay. uh, of the Labour Party. Okay. And Amanda, do you have any final questions uh, for David? I, I could keep him here all day asking questions, okay. but I think that was... Okay. Let's do that. that. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Donald Trump is not, I think, I can safely say the most popular of, prime minister, of presidents in Britain. Um, I think, um, I mean, my, my own view is um, I, I put money on Donald Trump being re-elected I think a month after he was elected the first time. 
Um, and my children, both of whom are American citizens, both of whom intend to live in America, neither of them have come to America, and they're disgusted at what's been going on. And I think in Britain, Donald Trump is probably regarded as an extraordinary aberration that is almost inexplicable. <laughs> and therefore, getting you re-elected would probably add to that. Um, uh, Nigel Farage, as the exponent of Donald Trump, kind of sums him up as far as the UK is concerned. I think that's my politest way of answering your question. Um, I mean, it's a very interesting question you asked, and, and it's a longer conversation than we should talk about why the ideological and, and sort of the correct thinking of New Labour today, if you like, as we know. By the way, my position on New Labour was, is, wasn't one of support. What, I was trying, what I've tried to do in the book is New Labour is now so completely condemned for all the reasons that you, you said, um, its obsession with the financial sector. Um, there is 240 billion of debt still owed for deals done on um, bringing in private investment into things like the NHS and education and building hospitals. And that was a huge error. And Brown, as well as Blair's obsession with the financial sector is certainly one of the problems I had. What I am trying to do however in the book is counter the idea that everything New Labour did was entirely wrong and not in the traditions of the Labour Party because that is the current view. So I'm trying to triangulate between those two positions. Why is New Labour, the New Labour think tank, the New Labour ideology, the New Labour thinking that existed so well for 20 years, why are you not hearing it anymore? Because it lost, it lost energy and faith in itself and also because um, a lot of the people who are involved in it, just in the way that the left went into the wilderness, are themselves being pushed into the wilderness. I mean, part of the thing that's interesting to me is, you know, New Labour controlled parliamentary selections rigorously. It can, its power was considerable. The left are doing to it what it did to them. And so those voices are not coming through. And if you look at new MPs elected to the House of Commons, the new 95 Labour MPs elected in 2015, they were all being selected by the left or by the unions to counter what would have been the New Labour theocracy of the previous years. And New Labour has basically just died on its own feet. The roots of it have basically gone, in my view. But we should have this conversation on a longer basis afterwards, because I think it's a very interesting question. Um, the Lib Dems. Well, there's obviously a leadership election going on in the Lib Dems at the moment. Poor old Sir Vince has come and gone, le leaving not much of a trace. You've got a 38-year-old female candidate against um, a former cabinet minister. So you've got Jo Swinson against Ed Davey. Uh, jo Swinson looks like she's going to win it. But, you know, Lib Dems are still basically, and the centre ground, as we've seen with the new political party that came and went without a trace in Change, uh, in change UK, the centre ground is being crushed by everything else. And if you're the Labour Party and you have the chance of going into coalition, at the moment, this week, for the first time, Labour and the Lib Dems and SNP are working together as a parliamentary bloc. But the idea that the Lib Dems are getting as many seats as the SNP in that election, I just don't think is going to happen. And actually, the SNP's economic policies are somewhat closer to Labour's than the Lib Dems at the moment. The Lib Dems have very few policies, and they're still being held accountable for tuition fees. Now, Joe Swinson was a minister in the coalition government. And believe me, she will be targeted on that basis as having voted for increases in tuition fees. So I'm not convinced the Lib Dems are, are coming back. And on gender balance, um, when you talk to people in the Labour Party about who the next leader of the Labour Party is going to be, there is one view, which is it has to be a woman. Because the Labour Party is embarrassed. The Conservatives have had two and they've had none. If the Conservative Party elects Saeed Javid as, 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 as a leader, then they will have the first BMA candidate as leader as well. This is a Conservative Party we're talking about. So Labour is kind of rocked to its foundations by the fact it appears to be electing an old white guy as opposed to Theresa May, who, if she had no other advantages, was at least, in fact, a woman. Um, <laughs> the problem with that, from a political perspective, is the three candidates who are most likely to stand who happen to be women are Emily Thornberry, who the left are deeply worried about because she is now taking a very strong position against Corbyn on Brexit. A woman called Rebecca Long-Bailey, who is the darling of the left and, and a protege of John McDonnell. And the third, who's getting union backing, is the Labour's um, education spokesman, uh, spokeswoman, um, Angela Rayner, who has not got the weight you would expect to the leader of a political party. The one candidate who does happens to be a white middle-aged man called Keir Starmer, who is currently the spokesman of Brexit. But he's neither off the left and nor is he a woman. So I think you will get your wish. I think we will see if Corbyn, if Labour loses the election, there will be a female leader of the Labour Party. 
The question is, for those of us, just bringing us back to the cover of the book, for those supporters of the Labour Party who want it to win, because 18 years of Conservatives being in power, which is what it would be if Conservatives win the election, like Margaret Thatcher and John Major's 18 years in power, for those of us who want Labour to win, the gender of the leader is an issue, but it's a secondary issue to having a leader capable of victory. And the real problem about what's going on in the modern Labour Party again, and the real problem for the left, is you would think, given what's happened in the last three years, this was a moment when they should be 20 points ahead in the polls, and this should be a straight path in the way that it was for Tony Blair, and that isn't happening. And we now live at a time where Labour's decision about whether it's going to be a party of power or a party of protest is as unclear as it's been at any time in the last 50 years. And for that, that is an extraordinary moment for those of us who are actually are looking for change. And I don't think we know whether a woman is enough to change that. Thank you. Amanda, any final sort of thoughts? Uh, no, I, I think this was, was extremely thorough, covering Scotland and Brexit and relations with the United States. And I, I am curious, since, since you were uh, sounding skeptical about whether or not Boris Johnson is in fact going to be the next Prime Minister, which we had Ed Lucas proclaiming on the stage yesterday he was. Ed Luce. Yeah. Uh, Ed Luce. Uh, uh, who, who, your, who your money is on? Well, uh, so I'll give you my view. So as, as somebody, like all good English liberals, I own a house in the country because, you know, you have to. And... Uh, so I'm surrounded by my friends who are members of the Conservative Party, and they're all farmers and business people. And I ask them, as my little sort of focus group, who they're going to vote for, because they're all members of this rather odd electorate. And not one of them is voting for Boris Johnson, because he is not seen as being serious. There is, in fact, a rather general desire in Britain at the moment for you know, any adult in 2020. And Boris Johnson came up with a memorable comment about business, which I don't know you well enough to repeat, but you probably know what I'm referring to. Well, he says F business, right? These people don't want another flippity gibbet egomaniac as prime minister who might, in fact, blow up. So I have an instinct, and it's only an instinct, and it's almost certainly going to be proved wrong, so I apologize now, that actually... Whoever is the other candidate against Johnson on anything like a, a campaign with Hustings, there is the possibility of Johnson blowing up and the Conservative Party leadership, uh, membership deciding they want an adult. And that adult, it appears to me, is probably Jeremy Hunt. I also think Jeremy Hunt against Jeremy Corbyn in the general election is a very different prospect than, than, than Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn. Boris Johnson against Jeremy Corbyn, as I start off by saying my opening remarks, is an incredible idea. <laughs> and you couldn't be conf confident of Boris Johnson winning. Jeremy Hunt, as the adult in the room against Jeremy Corbyn, I think if I were a Conservative voter, I'd be looking for an adult in the room. But it's an instinct. I have no inside knowledge. I think we wait to find out. It's going to be interesting. Well, we, we look forward to having you back here. Thank you. Uh, in the future, and then we can either um, gloat or concede on that bet, uh, <laughs> depending. But uh, David, thank you so much uh, for coming and visiting us today. The book is Power and Protest, The Battle for the Labour Party. It's on sale outside and also on Amazon and that book, maybe not that many bookshops in America, but certainly a Kramer books, I'm sure, politics and prose. So I highly recommend it. Amanda, thank you, thank you. Um, as well. And thank you all of, all of you for coming for the actual session. And with that, we're adjourned. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.